Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming here. This is the last hour of the art fair, so it's very good of you uh, to spend it in a conversation rather than catching the last glimpse of the art that's going to be dismantled in no time. Um, I'm very honored to have two old friends. They are very eminent art historians and art practitioners in Hong Kong. Um, among uh, expatriate uh, scholars and artists, they, they probably can claim to have, uh, have a real knowledge of Asia, Hong Kong, uh, as well as the international scene. Um, I'd like to introduce um, Frank Van Hong next to me. Um, he's an artist and a theoretician, an art historian, um, uh, and his teaching is mainly focused on um, European art history. But in his, in his practice as a curator, apart from his uh, art production, um, he has done work uh, that has deals with Chinese literati art. Um, so um, it, it is as a practitioner and um, a theoretician that uh, we hope he will enlighten us today. Um, uh, then uh, at, at the other side is um, uh, David Clark. David has been in Hong Kong also a very long time. And um, he has written books on Hong Kong art. So Hong Kong art as a modern art history is something which is very nebulous, difficult to grasp. Um, for a long time, it was invisible. So how do you see art and uh, how to place art, which for, for a long time has been invisible, and now um, suddenly finds itself caught in this maelstrom of artistic activity, Chinese and, and international. Um, it is a very interesting thing. So David is probably um, more equipped to speak to us about this than anybody else. He's also an artist, a uh, photographer who has exhibited uh, quite a few times. And uh, so he is also a practitioner who can look at art from the inside. So uh, welcome to Frank Van Yong and, um, and uh, David Clark. Thank you. Um, since we propose this um, sort of like a word play, oh, I am Johnson Chang. Uh, <clears throat> and um, I thought I would have my name on the menu. Uh, I. Um, uh, I have an uh, exhibition upstairs. Um, I run the uh, Han Art TZ Gallery. And uh, if you go out there and you see a very big landscape painting, um, that is the artist who we're exhibiting at our booth. Um, I have also been in Hong Kong uh, quite a long time. And uh, last year, we held a 30th anniversary show for which we had a big conference, an uh, international conference, um, on a thesis uh, which has to do with art history. But uh, that particular um, project was to put art history in the context of Chinese political, political and cultural history. Uh, the question that was being asked is, how do we look at Chinese modernity? And what does art tell us about Chinese modernity as a whole? Um, so it was a project that framed art in the context of what we called the three parallel art worlds, namely, um, the socialist world, the global capitalist world, and the world of the traditional literati art world. Um, this is intended to reflect not just um, art practices, but also the political and cultural realities of China. Um, China had this very special situation in which, for quite a long time, I would say even until today, uh, China has sat on both sides of the divide of the Cold War. Um, it was particularly evident in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and now things have changed a little bit. But um, there are a lot of um, um, characteristics that feature the three different art worlds in, in, um, in, that's happening in parallel. So the three parallel art worlds try to do this thing, and the question that we're post, posing today, what does an art work, how does an art work go to work? Um, uh, so this is an example that we could use the um, we could use the three parallel art worlds framework to discuss. Um, and this topic is only slightly current for us in Hong Kong, uh, for us in the art field, because this book that we worked on for the last year, which um, includes this conference on January last year, was just published, and the chief editor who has worked on it um, painstakingly for a whole year is Valerie Doran. She is on the front row. Um, so, also thank you. And um, the one example perhaps I should start this conversation with is this. Uh, if we look at the socialist art world um, and the capitalist art world, and of course the literary art world, what does um, 
we noticed that the artwork, what we call an artwork in these three worlds, in fact, uh, behave very differently. Um, mo the most important thing is not what they happen within the art world, but what happens, uh, what these artworks do to the, to the world outside of the art circle within their own realms. For example, we all seem to know what uh, an artwork does in the, so, uh, in the capitalist global art world. So we have this in the outside, which is one thing that it, the way it goes to work, is that it goes to work as a commodity. Um, it is being exchanged, it is being looked at. Um, but here it also works as a, an object of inquiry. We're here because we're curious about it. Um, but what does an artwork um, do to society at large in the two other art worlds? Uh, firstly, um, maybe the, the something which is most distant from us here uh, is the socialist art world. In the socialist art world, there's no art market. So the market does not play a role, but the government plays a very big role. Uh, and artwork is part of the whole ideological um, mechanism of the state. And uh, if we ask what it does, um, it certainly becomes very important as part of the uh, ideological makeup in, in, that, in the function that it defines what the society attempts to do for the future. Um, in a socialist country, an artwork basically uh, um, outlines for us the shape and form of the society to come, the, um, the future to happen. Um, whereas in the, the, the um, well, uh, a very simple example is that in the 70s, um, 60s, 70s in China, uh, if you go to China, every object you see, um, most daily utensils you use will have uh, the sayings of the chairman printed on it. There will be icons of the state uh, in a lot of the practical daily objects. They may not be artworks as we call it, but they certainly are a form of art. Um, and what they do is that they actually try to, to function outside of the art circle. They try to transform the world outside of the art circle. They try to tell you how to change your life, how society should go forward, move away from what it is. Um, it is not satisfied with just looking at uh, what happens on the art field or reflecting on existing situations. Um, if you take a look at the, um, if you took a look at the global capitalist art world, um, we find another very strange thing which will not happen in the socialist art world which is you can take an everyday uh, object, an ordinary thing, and you take it into the art sphere, you put it in a museum, and if it's endorsed by an artist, it is an artwork. Um, so the, uh, the way the, so, uh, the capitalist global art world functions in this case is it, in a way, uh, tries to make sense for us or try to expand the meaning of art within the world we live in. Um, for example, I, I saw some paintings by Michael Craig Martin, and one very famous work he made in the, um, oh goodness, must be 70s now. Um, and uh, that particular work, he put a glass of water in the exhibition hall. And that was artwork, and he has a list of questions, and it basically questions the everyday thing and how it actually can become an artwork in this space, and it provokes us to relook at our, our own predicament. Uh, whereas in the literati art world, uh, the artwork does something very, very uh, strange. Because in China's literati art, what is called fine art always has to do with the written word. Um, calligraphy, painting, but painting, um, aesthetic decisions are often made on its brushwork. So reflecting its relation to calligraphic writing. Um, there's also seal carving, which is essential art about the written word as well. And these are the principal fine art in, in, uh, in the literati art world. But what it has to do with the world outside of the art sphere is interesting, because what it does is it takes something that people use every day as a practical tool, especially the tool used by, um, used by the, um, the class of people who are in political and cultural power. And it elevates that this tool, that what they do every day, uh, and turns it and makes it available as a source for making art, making something which is rarefied and higher. So, um, so in these three worlds, there apparently what the artwork does to the world outside, to the circle outside the, what is 
enshrined by uh, either the art platform or the exhibition hall or the, or the um, salon circles, um, they, they function differently. So with this example, uh, with, this, um, with this prelude, um, I hope to um, ask my friends here to, to enlighten us to what can their I thoughts. Can I just ask for a clarification about your terminology you've explained? But um, you talk about artworks, which we often do, and the idea of art artwork is already uh, the idea that the, this art thing is a very active thing. It's not a passive thing in the transaction. Um, but on the subtitle of your book, you uh, use a slightly different terminology. You say art things. Is, are they interchangeable terms, or you, you have a slightly different association? Um, we, we are now in the habit of talking about artwork. This is why it is possible to pun on this work, uh, how art goes to work. But of course, it also reflects on uh, other implications of the concept of how, what art does in the modern world. Um, the fact that we use the word uh, art production, we call art practices. Um, these, are, these are works, words very much uh, imbued with uh, rem uh, implications of Marxist terminology and also terminology of uh, economic production. And so it already um, leads, uh, already, already um, makes implications um, of what this art object does. And um, by calling things art things, I'm actually trying to, uh, to differentiate between things which are, are considered art in one of these three worlds may not be considered art in the other world. Um, Michael Craig Martin's glass of water needed the exhibition hall to work, and it would certainly not work within the socialist world. But um, in reverse, a lot of the propaganda art today will say, well, this is just propaganda, it's not art. But in the socialist world, they are art because they function um, as part of the, um, uh, as part of the machinery uh, of creating uh, a, a visual, um, a visual realization of the vision of the society. Right. <laughs> um, in fact, I, I, I'd rather start with uh, the people making these things, because their function and you know what what they're doing and how what they are doing is being represented by these different cultures in fact has a direct impact on how these things are perceived. And uh, I'll start with the, the, older, the older bit, the literati uh, artist. Um, first, we should remember that you know, words like art and artist are not exactly or not at all the same in the past. We don't, you know, yizhu, the Chinese word for art is a, it's a 20th century invention that basically comes from Japan, in fact. Before that, you have painters, calligraphers, and poets in China. And uh, in the context of literati painting, where there is, as you said, no, well, also like in the socialist part, but differently, there's no real art market. Uh, literati make art basically for each other, which also explains, for instance, why the, the art theory produced by the literati tend to, it looks like it doesn't change for very long periods of time because they're all based on the same Neo-Confucian philosophy. So it's literati painters painting for each other, talking to each other. And in this context, there is no real implications of, of money. You don't, words, sorry, works get exchanged, but you don't buy them. Although by the 18th century, things like this change profoundly. But uh, one thing that sort of blur our vision of that particular system of exchange of artworks is that um, normally literati artists and professional artists are not supposed to belong to the same world. And by the 18th century, the limits between literati and professional gets more, more and more blurred. And although artists start to sell stuff, they will not admit it. So if, if you read the, the art theory, for instance, they are still talking about the, the high moral uh, requirements, the ethical you know, dimension of making art, and it's not supposed to be about money or anything like this. So you have this rather complex history of 
the high art of literati, of the literati, which has nothing to do with uh, the fetishism of commodity, as Marx would put it. And in many ways, this comes with, of course, a very elitist uh, understanding and approach of what art is. And when the, 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 the communist regime comes to, to be, this elitism of literary art is, of course, violently rejected. And the, the one thing that, in a sense, doesn't change is that there is no money, there is no market for, in, the, in the socialist world, but you still have artists. And the, the role, the identity of the artist in communist China, at least for the first, you know, from the 1950s to the 1960s, and I guess up until the 70s, is that they are under suspicion because they are always being you know, attacked by the government because they are they're not supposed to be the individual artists that the literati painters used to be. So they are asked to work in group. Uh, there were um, the example of the artist village, for instance. Uh, Michael Sullivan wrote interesting pages about this, that uh, in the artist village, the peasants are supposed to be the artists, so you don't have words and so on. The reality is that you had a lot of professional artists who were already professional artists before 1949 sent to the villages to work with the peasants. And in fact, in the end, only the real artists made the works that was identified by the state as peasant art. And you have, you know, I always was fascinated by, uh, in the 1970s in Europe, you have, you have a lot of Maoists. Uh, people who believe in the revolution, who think that Mao Zedong is the bomb, you know, it's wonderful. And you have this French artist called Gérard Fromanger. Well, I, I almost bought a Mao jacket in uh, Camden Market in London, but it was a bit too expensive, actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my, my dad, uh, I, I was born in Hong Kong, my parents were working here, and he had uh, the entire paraphernalia, and you know, he, he could dress as a Mao soldier if he wanted to. This has vanished, unfortunately. And uh, where was I? Sorry, I, I lost right. my. <laughs> I do that a lot. The, the Maoists in Europe, Gérard Fromanger, that's right, who, who gets invited uh, by the communist, the Chinese Communist Party, to come to China, and he made a portrait of the most famous of these uh, peasant artists. And I always thought it was fascinating because. In spite of the very Maoist frame of mind of this French artist and China as it were then, he was still making a portrait of an artist, even though the artist, the peasant artist, was not supposed to be identified as an artist. You also have a very complex set of relationships that create a very different idea of what artists are and what they're doing. And so, uh, yes. Can you elucidate a little bit? Um, this French artist make this work in China. Uh, well, he but went to China, and took photos, and when came back and did and, the, the portrait. And this, this work, where was it exhibited? And who, had, who did he make this work for? Oh well, he did. So he made it for the uh, for the global for the Euro, for the Euro, exactly for the European market, of course, of course. But uh, in those days, in, in in Europe, you know, it was also the time, for instance, when uh, Jean-Luc Godard stops making films in his own name. He he works together with his friends. They, they call themselves the, the Gigavertov group from the, the, the Russian movie maker. And uh, it, it's interesting because when you look at the, the films of Godard made at that time who are very communist, very Maoist and so on, they're still pure Jean-Luc Godard movie. <laughs> so no matter what the political context is, you cannot escape the identity of the artist. And I'm, I'm tempted to say that, you know, uh, the only reason why everybody's paying so much money to buy art in a place like Art Basel is because, you know, in spite of the art education we tend to, to, to provide today, which is more about social engagement and stuff like this, uh, we are still basing the art market today on the notion that art is made by special people who are the artists. Because if it's not made by special people, if anyone can do it, why pay so much money? So it's very interesting to see that, you know, no matter what the, the intellectual background of a period is, you always, no matter, you know, if you want to, to fight against the notion of the special person as the artist, it's, it always comes back, uh, sometimes you, in a hidden you way. You could say that even, in the, even during the 
the Maoist period, artists had their own power in a way that, that, that the state couldn't just use tanks and guns. They needed to use ideology to Absolutely. keep people in place. And Absolutely. they needed specialists in the, the promotion of ideology to yes. do that. And therefore, yeah. artists did have some power to some extent. Um, so I, I'd like to question in a way whether we can re really even talk about Maoist art as socialist art for two reasons. One is uh, I don't see Maoism, I see Maoism or uh, Stalinism and Leninism even uh, already uh, early, earlier in the century as a sort of betrayal of socialism. Uh, it's, a, it's just some totalitarianism or something you want to call it. That's a kind of sort of radical critique. So first of all, I don't think it was really socialist art. Sometimes the theme is socialist, but you know, in the Cultural Revolution, a lot of the time the theme is about hierarchy. It's about Mao as a sort of quasi-imperial uh, benefactor who makes everything right. And that's completely anti-socialist, actually, presented as socialism. And although I find a lot of that art a little bit boring, I am interested in the way, you know, that, that, that in that time art was taken into radically new contexts, and Johnson mentioned that, you know, so art would be found in this, being paraded in the street, it would be found in the, in the home, you know. Um, yeah, that's interesting, and there are sort of parallels to, to uh, of course, one always wants to, once someone puts down um, a theory, you always want to think of the exception, so I, I think there's some sort of parallels between the sort of performative use of art in the Maoist era or performative use of symbols like Mao swimming the Yangtze as a kind of performance art in a way. I mean, and a lot of the way Chinese performance art, Xing Wei Yishu has developed, it has a sort of flavor that you can hard, it's hard to imagine without uh, public activities that took place during the cultural revolution or the whole Maoist period, the certain kind of severity, extremity uh, of it seems to owe, 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 owe to that. And, and another way in which I would say, you know, to cut down the notion of um, whether it, that art is socialist is that I do find a lot of very interesting art made in that period by ink painters. Somehow the, uh, there's something about the medium of ink painting uh, that... Uh, allowed a degree of resistance from, from uh, Maoist ideology because there's something in the use of the brush that innately is expressive and individualistic, uh, partly because it's for uh, many hundreds of years it had been used in that way. Uh, so um, even, if, even if the state wanted uh, people to not be individualistic and even if the artists were trying their best to, to be obedient, you know, nevertheless... Uh, many wonderful artworks were made by ink painters. Not so much by oil painters, I have to say. They seem to embody the state ide ideology much more directly. But Fu Baoshe, for instance, is someone I, I love, uh, uh, who, who made great works, in my opinion, during that, uh, that period. Um, uh, this Mao swimming the Yang Tzu as a, as a performed artwork, I think, is a, is a brilliant uh, idea and also illustrates. All, all, all activities and all cultural gestures uh, had an ideological um, purpose. And perhaps it is, this is really what ties together all these different artists who either have, in, uh, have individual expression in the work or not have individual expression in the mm -hmm. work. Um, they are all reflecting. Um, they, are, they are all still tied to this one vision of history, mm -hmm. which is... Um, the great future they, they're going to realize. Yes. So I, I would like to see that ink painting is sort of there within uh, so-called socialist society. So to some extent, the interesting things in modern Chinese art to me happen uh, when those separate distinctions of the art world start to break, break down or, you know, artists try to work across the boundaries, you know. Um, uh, uh, like a Hong Kong example, I know you like the work of Louis Chan. You know, he, he's someone who um, is deeply aware of Western art, but sometimes he'll make a, a hand scroll format or a, a, a hanging scroll f format. You know, he doesn't seem to worry too much about whether it's Chinese or not. He just sort of 
goes ahead and just does it, you know, and it, it, it works, you know, and puts everything together. And about the, art, about the artist himself, because we mentioned individuality by both of you, um, uh, what would that, that um, there was some discussion of the difference between the two worlds when these uh, artists uh, do the work uh, in the socialist world or the capitalist world, respectively. In the socialist, in the capitalist world, like the world we're in today here, uh, what the, what one thing that people valorize, uh, what people value, is the valorization of the individual, of the personality, and uh, very often to the extreme, it is the it is a valorization to the individual to a cult level, so that the artist is the, is a big rock star. Um, whereas in uh, in the socialist world, although it is the individual who later on get the, uh, the, the, is the individual artists who are professional, who, who gets identified. But in extreme years of the Cultural Revolution, when Mao trying to push through socialism from 67 to uh, 69, in fact, in 272, um, artists were forbidden to use their own names. They were supposed to make works in collectives. So it is making the work uh, that, that is the purpose, and they are, they are doing it for a cause. Um, and in this case, Individual individuality appears to be uh, to be suppressed or um, or or, or um, diversified in in this group work. Um, what what do you see? Did you see this sort of um, activities, these group art projects, to be something that is possible for today in the um, in the world that we, in the art world we are working in? Uh, yeah some of the experiments you were talking about was uh, those large socialist realist oil painting, uh, a number of them were made through committees. A lot of people coming together and deciding on absolutely every detail of the painting. But we've all worked in committees. There's always someone who speaks more loudly than someone else. So in spite of the fact that, yes, names were suppressed and so on, we always know who would be uh, sort of leading the pack, basically. And it's a very, very short-lived period, too. But it was there. And I also think it's one of the most interesting aspects of you know, so-called socialist realism. Um, but there were all the, you know, for instance, why, why, was Chi Pai, why is Chi Pai Shi the most famous Chinese artist of the 20th century? Uh, because uh, he was promoted by the Communist Party because he had all the right uh, background. You know, he was coming from a poor family. He was not coming from a literati family and so on. So, uh, that's what's so interesting in the so-called socialist period, because you have all these different, very different I would say also he ways. has a certain social status already that they have to negotiate with. Exactly. You know, they want to yes. have him as a little icon. Exactly, you know. exactly. In spite of the fact that, you know, as you were saying, what he does is incredibly individualistic and very, very personal. This was sort of uh, put on the back burner, basically, and ignored and not used for promotion. And um, I, once again, I get sidetracked and I forgot the question. <laughs> but this is a, a very interesting part, you've brought, a very interesting issue you've brought up. Because at the beginning of the uh, People's Republic, these so-called uh, Hua Yuan art academies were set up. But they were not teaching academies. They were basically institutions uh, created to house these established masters and to transform them as well, to make them, to make them aware of their, 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 uh, the role they should be playing in society. But what is interesting um, is that in the socialist world, not only are these art academies being uh, created uh, not for teaching purposes, just for this kind of uh, way of uh, grouping or classifying uh, professionals, it happened in many other types of uh, practices. Say, now we make a big fuss of uh, Kun Xu, the Chinese opera from near Jiangsu, to be a high form of art, and it would have, it might have perished had not it was had not it not had it not been preserved by the Kunshu opera houses, that the government, in fact, sponsored and created uh, as social institutions at the time. So this institution building of the of the socialists, um, perhaps, is something interesting to look at in comparison to institution build, building of the global capitalist world, because certainly they are very different from the pre-modern, the literati world. 
I, I would like to go back to this, um, you know, the thing of artworks doing things that you started off with. I, I, I think it's important to keep both the, a sense of artwork as active itself and as passive, something we use to do things with, but also something that itself can can do things. You know, like sometimes art historians who are interested in psychoanalysis, they sort of try to provide a psychoanalytic reading of an artwork, but actually an artwork doesn't have an unconscious, actually. It's an object. So what is happening is the object is psychoanalyzing them in a way. You know, it's the active part of the process. Um, I think that it's good to keep both the sense of the active and the passive, both the sense of an artwork as a thing and the sense of an art as that in the world of material things, but also an artwork as a sign or collection of signs or operating in the world of meanings. You know, both of those are important facts. So that it's, it's, there's good work done, say, like by the art historian Clay, Craig Clunas. He did very interesting work on uh, art as material culture. One, th one thing that interests me, I, I did this book called Water and Art, which is about modern art that has subject matter or um, medium to do with water. And one of the things that um, interested me there is, is just water as a thing uh, and how you can, um, it's a kind of thing that's often overlooked when you talk about art. People will talk about the ink or the brush but, and the paper or whatever, but they won't talk about the, the water which has evaporated before that uh, art object is, is seen by an audience. Um, so uh, my interest there is on something that's at the very edge of how you can talk about things. Is water a thing? You know, it's something ungraspable. It evaporates and disappears all, all the time. But I think it's also important to think of art as meaning. So as well as the physical context in which art is made, there's also the context that we as historians and interpreters bring to art. And those contexts are not Sometimes we can think of them as sort of fixed things, but I think that's wrong. Uh, we are always actively bringing context to interpret art. Uh, so maybe it's better to use a word like frame. You bring a frame to interpret art. Or if you're an old-fashioned Marxist, you think that uh, reality is sort of fixed and you interpret art in terms of that social reality. But if, if you're a, a bit more postmodern than that, then you, you might think we, we bring our own frames of interpretation. But um, one interesting thing to me about the literati context is that it's something specific, not just, it's not just a context that art is put in, but it's something, a context the art itself makes uh, by being such an expressive trace of a hand of a person uh, that when, when someone looks at it, they, they can almost see how it was made stroke by stroke, especially with calligraphy, of course. So then you have a sort of empathy with the person that ma made it. So it, it, it has a quality of um, linking uh, across time and or across uh, or even just between friends but also across time even over dynasties you have a sense of all being part of one group so uh, if it, it, you know uh, western oil painting with um, brush strokes that you can't uh, tell apart and many layers of paint that you can't tell what is underneath can't, can't do that that job. So there's some, it's something, it's not the, that the, so the art is active, actively carving out a social world. If I had to think of a Western or modern equivalent, it would be something like photography, um, you know, say a family photo album creates a family in some sense, uh, you know, it, you, you, by sitting together looking at your shared photos or by, uh, you know, sharing them electronically as we would do nowadays, you create a a sense of community. It didn't, isn't, you're, you're not just talking about a community that already existed. So your memories of your family are those photos that you, you have of your family. Oh, so the reading an artwork is a very important experience in, um, in making an artwork come to life. And uh, people read art right in very many different ways, but uh, what um, David has just pointed out, this intimate close reading of art uh, is one thing that is interesting. Uh, in this situation we have here outside, uh, because it's not fair, and uh, the galleries are very eager to engage you, so you are, you are allowed to get very close to the artwork. But in a proper uh, museum setting, you're generally not allowed to touch the artwork, and uh, um, 
and very often the situation is created so that the artwork becomes almost like um, a sacred item and it enhances the value of the artwork. And this is, uh, this is led to the effect that many artists do these in uh, intervention works, they do uh, interactive works. Um, um, but uh, there's another situation which is very different, which is the literati world. In the literati Chinese art world, um, firstly, people in the old, people in the pre-warden world, 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 there was no such thing as an exhibition site for artwork to do its job. Um, and a lot of the time, apart from reading art in the studio, they were done in the garden. And as we all know, the Chinese rock garden, which is supposed to be a piece of nature, um, are mostly artificial. And uh, when you look at a landscape painting in the rock garden, um, what it implies is that you're reading the landscape in its own context of another landscape. Uh, you're, you're reading nature within nature, uh, hopefully, I mean, it's a theme. So um, it highlights, um, firstly, the difference, and, uh, and this thing as the artwork. But it also um, brings in the, the other dimension of the, uh, of the connoisseurs engaging um, this literati gathering, because uh, very often you're asked to do something. You have to make comments, uh, since it is, a, is, it, is it an invited audience. You're, you might be asked to write a poem. You might be asked to uh, add to the painting uh, or, or uh, to do a work um, together as a, as a project. Now, um, this, uh, this, this type of reading of the art together Doing things together is very different from the art world of the global capitalist uh, framework, but it is somehow close to the uh, socialist project, although um, it becomes more of a um, it, art is in the public space. Um, there is more public participation, um, but the big difference is is not a, a personal relation. Um, the last two examples actually. Uh, leads to another example that we, we, we're experiencing in Hong Kong now, which is like the Occupy movement. I was just about to mention yeah. that, you know, because then there, there is no party telling you what to do, but people are collectively making, uh, you, if you want to call it art or items of visual culture, collectively. Maybe it's just a little um, um, baby umbrella or something, but um, it's all meaningful in terms of the activity that you have worked together to to do that, and the fact that you're giving it to other people rather than selling it or fetishizing it as a commodity. And what would the, uh, what would the well, we do all know that there's a lot of visual production being made during these uh, Occupy movements. People start to do things, protest banners, they start to create activities between the people who are there, and um, it is a type of, uh, it's a visual production, we do not call it an art production. And uh, how would you characterize it as a, in, a, from a position of an art historian? But I think it's, you know, art has always been uh, involved with making communities in different ways. Like a lot, a, a lot, a lot of 20th century Chinese art one way and another, not just in the Maoist years, but before, is involved in one way and another in trying to create a sense of nation. Uh, you know, and that, that's, uh, I think, one... Although you still see artists using ink, I, and sometimes people call it literati style art, I don't think it's literati art because that society is already, already gone. Uh, but it's, uh, that art often is used to, not to talk to a, a literati fellow community, but to talk now to an, a new larger audience, a national audience, to interpolate them as being citizens of a new nation that only started in 1911, 1912 anyway. Uh, and uh, in a way, the, the Maoists were much more successful at doing that. It, it was often very much more tentative before that time. Uh, so a lot of art since has been making community. But I'm very interested. Part of my interest in Hong Kong art is because it's Hong Kong's not a nation. So it's um, it's when you deal with Hong Kong identity in art, you're, you're actually working against those kind of grand narratives of identity, which are usually, I think, a bit boring to me. But making, uh, making communities is a very good point. Um, perhaps it's about making new communities. Um, but I do see a link to the literati gatherings. 
um, no, no, uh, nobody really knows what these literatis were talking in, in these private gardens. They could be plotting a coup. As we all know, the um, Xiao Dao Hui in Shanghai, uh, in Yu Yuan, was, was beginning of the um, uh, revolution. Um, so these kind of uh, 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 communities, whether they, are, um, whether they are engaged in affirming a, uh, a community that is already existing, or pushing forward for a new community as we're doing, looking at the um, Occupy movement, um, uh, if we look at it as, the, uh, as an activity within a special space, there's one the thing- The Yawk Fair will be closing in 15 minutes. We have 15 minutes Enjoy more conversation. So. Thank you. Um, but, but if you want to bring in the question of quality for a minute, I mean, I, although I, I love the making little um, I wasn't umbrellas or whatever, but um, I think great art is often not just about making a community, but sort of uh, problematizing something. Uh, like the, there's a very famous art historical reading by T.J. Clark of uh, Manny's Olympia and how it was first received when it was first published. And he's talking about how it's an object that doesn't fit in the normal story about the nude and doesn't fit in uh, the normal story about how you would represent a prostitute in art. It actually brings them together. It's a little bit like the way the um, anthropologist uh, Mary Douglas talks about all the little ways we categorize the world, but then the interesting thing is where those categories don't work. So, uh, for example, a pangolin becomes a, a taboo animal because it, you, you can't quite work out what category it should go into. And, and that, that's when I think when art starts to get really, you know, to another level. But on a more basic level, we can say, see, say these things which are unusual, which could be and could not be artwork, we can also only ask these questions because we have this institutional framework, which we call the art world. Um, we have the art platform. So between the Occupy Central uh, students and the literati gathering in the garden, um, could there be some similarities between the two spaces? Because certainly um, the literati garden, like the White Cube Museum, is a rarefied space. Um, when it is not being used as a, as, as a family garden, uh, when this type of activities are going on, um, it is, uh, it is slightly, it's slightly sanctified, and also it is slightly uh, beyond the law. It, you are actually given a space which has, which has uh, this dimension of being not the ordinary. And uh, uh, perhaps we can also say the fact that um, these students were not immediately locked up and were allowed this period of, to use a public space like that. They were allowed this space for a period of time beyond the law. And so in that sense, it is comparable as an art space. All of them were used to your students, what you say, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> that's true, that's true. <clears throat> uh, I, I never thought of looking at the Umbrella Movement as a, as a gathering of literati, honestly. <laughs> There was um, one of our, I don't know if it was a student, Samson Young, who was very, um, very involved in there. And there was this presentation by Oscar Ho talking about the art of the Umbrella Movement. And Samson was saying, you know, this is, this is not art, but you know, that's debatable, of course. And he was saying that the only, the only reason why so much stuff was made during the Umbrella Movement is because pe people were bored. They didn't know what to do with themselves. And it seems to be a a natural human behavior to make stuff with your hands. And that's what these things happen. That's why I wouldn't look at it as a, you know, a literati gathering. Literati knew what they were going to do when they came together. And they didn't do it out of boredom. I don't think so. But then what is going to be more interesting is what's how the objects produced during the Umbrella Movement will be read and interpreted and collected from now on. You know, uh, we've heard that uh, M plus is not really interested in collecting the stuff from the Umbra movement. I, I hope they will reconsider because after all, if you call yourself a museum of visual culture, you shouldn't make too much decision based on so-called aesthetics, I, I believe. So I wonder what this will have, you know, Oscar is going to do this exhibition 
uh, next month at JCCAC, and I wonder what will happen to these objects once the exhibition is, is, is over. Yeah. I mean, one, one difference to the literati is that there's a big audience. You know, like, I think the first time I really noticed this was with the Goddess of Democracy in Beijing in 89. You know, it's, it's on such a large scale, partly because it has to read for the TV cameras that are there before Gorbachev's visit, you know, and to circulate it around the world. And so when it's knocked down, you'll see it being knocked down, and that's also part of its meaning. And I think much of what was done visually during the uh, Umbrella Movement was with a sense of be being, it being a spectacle for electronic transmission, either through the, the news media, but also through your own, uh, you know, Instagramming of what, or whatever that you're going to do with those images, dissemination yourselves. And even in classical art history, uh, in the Renaissance, a lot of the great artists, Bellini and all these artists, they would have produced things for processions in the street, religious processions, and also secular ones. So it's a visual production that now we say, wow, this is, this is very valuable now. But in those days, it could have been uh, another umbrella. I'd like to say something different, which is uh, like, well, we're in a, a contemporary art fair, but we're not actually talking that, well, the umbrella movement is contemporary, but a lot of the other things we're talking about is not contemporary. But I'd just like to make this point. That I, don't, I don't believe in contemporary art as an analytical category. I, I think what's more interesting is all the art that exists now uh, is, you know, now, that's fine. Uh, contemporary... Uh, why focus just on the things that exist now that have been made recently? That's bizarre to me. I mean, and something really old could be just as new in a way uh, and come from just a, a different mindset than something that's just been made, perhaps even more so, you know, something from a totally different cultural context or another time. So I'd, I'd like to kind of, um, I mean, a lot of my writing, I break down the decision between the, the, the distinction between modern and contemporary uh, because I, 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 don't, I, I see continuities, or I think it makes more sense to put all, all in one frame. So uh, it's always strange, a place like Art Basel, where you know, the, what's happened, or what's been made in the last few years is seen in a kind of vacuum from earlier, hi earlier history. Well, there are some art fairs, um, especially art fairs of antiquities, now tend to bring in more than contemporary art. Uh, and breaking this barrier to give different meaning to, to the things in the, uh, in the fair. But, um, but of course, I suppose it also has to do with economics. Uh, if you break the barrier, does it make the item more valuable or less? If it makes it less valuable, I'm sure the fair operators will be very much less reluctant to do it. But um, uh, what you were saying on, on, another, on another level is, is very important, is uh, how do we bring things alive? Which have been, uh, which have served, it, which have seen the the, the, the time, and now um, being museumized, and how do we bring it back to life again? So um, it is, in a way, how to give back to things, especially these art things, um, uh, a life or a value that is due to itself. But what would you have to say on on on, um, on the users of? I, I would say that, 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 you know, we're, I, I'm very much uh, Jacques Lacan, Slavo Zizek, Rida, so I'm more interested in the empty and the fact that there is nothing there with an artwork but what the culture and people bring to it. It's like we, in French we call it a, a Spanish inn, you know, you bring to the inn what you're going to eat. And um, it's, you know, we, we, keep thinking about uh, the aura, you know, Walter Benjamin and so on, that uh, thinking that the artwork has an aura, that it's, you know, it has something in there that pertains to itself, uh, is, I, I think, a complete misreading. We, we built the aura of the artworks, and that also made me think of what you talked about, you know, looking at artworks in the gardens of the literati, and that the, the painting of the literati, which is not something made for display, it's something you keep in a box and come out and you take out from time to time. And uh, Benjamin had very interesting st stuff to say about, you know, the cult value and the cultural value of artworks. So I would, I, I don't understand the idea that you know there is something intrinsic in the artwork that pertains to it and is sort of stable. 
I don't think it's true at, at all, really. Yeah. No, I tend to agree with you, which is um, uh, why the proposal of the three parallel art worlds is really trying to understand how an institutional framework um, allows things to appear or gives definition to things. And also, it, it makes it possible for people to make things for that particular framework. I think it's certainly it's really a distinctive thing about Chinese artistic modernity that it, it has this inner heterogeneity of um, ways of making art, not just styles, something, it's more than just stylistic diversity, but it, it's, a, it's a whole mindset and, um, as you say, to some extent, different contexts. Since you brought up the... But, even, but even, even like in the Maoist period, there was Hong Kong and there was Taiwan that was outside those worlds. So the heterogeneity and is, uh, it, you know, has many dimensions. Mm -hmm. We did have five minutes. Well, would anybody like to ask any questions? Or bring up some points for discussion? We have a question. Um, you were talking about the aura of artwork and how we produce those auras. And um, I'm just wondering um, a related question on the aura of art history. Because um, I have been, I have seen a lot of um, older works uh, emerging, like I've seen some of them um, showing up in the art, art fair uh, in terms of contemporary Chinese art. Um, the works produced in late 1970s, the start movement, or the works related to 85 New Wave. Um, and you don't see them that often in mainland China, so it's quite refreshing to see them at the art fair. And when I um, listen to the gallery's conversation with the potential buyers, and it's always this um, emphasis on how this work is so important in this, in this um, historical context, and this work has been canonize and look at these books, look at these catalogs, and, um, and uh, a lot of um, works, I think, without the social context, um, the work itself has kind of um, like low artistic value, but if you put them into that context, it becomes historically important. Um, so I'm just wondering, like uh, Johnson, you as a as a, a scholar um, and important galleries, you also produce many writings and participated in the making of Chinese art history. So I'm just wondering this kind of, um, um, I don't know if I should use the word tension or it def definitely interaction or feeding into, into each other of, um, of um, um, uh, participating in art history, making art history through exhibition and writing, and then um, operating a gallery in the marketplace? Well, um, history is always being edited and rewritten as, as time goes on. And uh, um, in a way, um, one can say, we, we tend to look at it as an objective force, but in fact, um, a lot of it can be contingent because one actor decides that his view um, is interesting and his view managed to influence more people than others, then it becomes more, um, more established. Um, and of course there are some perspectives that are more, uh, 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 more successful in explaining the situation. Um, but certainly art as something which has value depends very much on its, uh, on its context. And, and insti by institutional framework we were just talking about includes a history, how works get canonized, how certain trends get, uh, get um, uh, uh, lionized as representative of the age. And uh, perhaps one of the things that uh, artworks, as, uh, as we call them, do is that uh, they, de uh, they delineate for us um, the form of their time and as historical items, whether something delineates the, the form, the spirit of the time, uh, successfully, they become more important in the long run. But then, of course, that understanding of the time also is negotiable and changes. So um, it is a precarious affair. 
uh, we have two professional historians here, perhaps. <laughs> I would say, you know, the, you, you're always interpreting art in relation to a context, but then the question, the, to me, the key would be, does, if you have that, bring that contextual information to understanding a work of art, does it actually change the way you look at it, or is it just some background? You know, like, if you say, uh, when the artist painted this painting, he was wearing... Uh, a green tie, you know, okay, that's contextual information, but it, it won't change you the way you, you, you look at the painting. But uh, say a, a Monet painting he painted in uh, 1889, 1890 of ice on a river, uh, maybe if you, if you bring the contextual information, well, that was just this, the, a few months after his wife had died. Actually, it's now closing. Thank you for visiting all awesome. You may see the painting in a different way. You may see it as ex ex expressing his feelings about subjective emotions, you know. Or you just bring the information you just bring the information that actually that was one of the really coldest winters in in French history for fifty years or something. That, uh, and th that brings you the information that those ice flows are pretty unusual. It's not something that happens every winter. Uh, maybe you see the image in a different way. So context, if context actually transforms your experience, then it's relevant. You know, that's a criteria of relevance for you. And I think we always need more than one context. You know, like we, the title of the book is Three Parallel Art Worlds. Well, we need, I think we need many different perspectives in art history. Uh, I'm very wary about sort of grand theories that will in explain everything. I think what we need at the moment is more of fragmentation, looking at art from different perspectives, including geographical perspectives. You know, like I'm, I'm interested in what we can see from a Hong Kong perspective, you know. And those different perspectives need to talk to each other, talk across their blind spots, if you like. Oh, sorry, yes. <laughs> um, I, all, well, I'm not sure there is anything in the artwork, again, that, that comes out of it, if, if that's what you meant. I'm, I'm not exactly sure. And, uh, you know, I was, was thinking, I'm, I'm very interested in the uh, institutional history of art, you know, the fact that uh, Michelangelo is Michelangelo, not because he's made the Sistine Chapel, but because he became one, a part of a canon established by the Academy, the first academy in the 17th century, and later on was picked up by early 20th century art history, you know, well, late 19th century, I should say. Art history itself created the idea of art that we still struggle with today, in fact. So I, you know, artworks can be invisible as long as the institution doesn't pick it up and make it into uh, a spectacle, in a sense. So, yes, but that's why I, I think I'm a, I, 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 know, I, I tend to struggle with the idea that I, I am an art historian. I don't think I am. I don't think you are either, oh, okay. but by the way, and it's, it is a compliment, okay? Hey, we need another hour, you know, how can we, I think it's just starting to get interesting. <laughs> but yeah, no, that's a very interesting question, and also that the the historicization, can I, say, can I say that? Historicization of the last 20 to 30 years in, of Chinese art is very interesting because it came very quickly and it's been institutionalized by art fairs and, and, and commercial galleries who usually use that narrative to, to sell the work, basically. And, and we, we are stuck with this now. And that, that's why I was also interested in, in, in your choice. You know, you were in Kaohsiung, this this three sort of, uh, sep well, they're not separate, but they can be looked at separately. And, and you know, we, there's no, as you say, there's no grand narrative. It gets reconstituted, re reshaped, reformulated all the time, in fact. But there are some things that we are stuck with, yes. You know, I teach, as uh, Johnson was saying, by the way, my domain is also Chinese art. It, it always was, all right? But I was, uh, because of my face, I suppose, I'm supposed to teach Western art also to my students at Chinese University. <laughs> and uh, the way I teach Western art is usually the same uh, sequence of, uh, you know, a Baroque, Rococo, and a Romantic, and so on. Although I, I do struggle with it all the time. But if I don't do this, it, it 
confuses the student so much that it becomes useless. So I'm sort of forced into these old institutional choices in uh, you know, creating these sequences of events. And when I, I realize that I might, when I teach 20th century Chinese art, I do the same. And it is uh, problematic, but that's what education requires. But know, can we, could we teach it in a way that doesn't put those two things in separate boxes, separate courses, you know, that we just look at the field of art history as a whole and... Um, because I, I like, I'm very interested in, uh -huh. uh, in those figures that cross those boundaries, you know, and don't, uh, don't you know, their story is, is a, yes. a global story. The fair is now closing. Thank you for uh, visiting our bus. Uh, all right, Please so. make your way to the exit. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, well, this is very we'll typical. I think it's possible, but it needs time, and that's typical. We don't have the time to explore new ways of teaching art and its history, in fact. Uh, generally, we're stuck with that. Yeah. Well, we're having an experience of the contemporary, because to be contemporary means to be together with time. And, uh, and uh, well, I think it's very, very uh, enlightening what we have from these two artists, art historians, theoreticians. Um, Certainly, I think uh, we don't agree. Uh, for decades, we've been talking about how we should uh, how we should jettison this linear history of things, one movement co coming after another, and um, uh, and certainly we have examples of things that happen uh, that should be looked at from different frameworks that happen simultaneously at the same time and which can be com compared. Um, so uh, we have been thinking about China from the literati in contemporary. But also Hong Kong is part of the story, so I'm glad that this has been brought up and, and to put this um, conversation in context of where we are. And we're not on, only um, a contemporary, we're, we, have a foot on, we, or have, we have our feet on the ground as well. Thank you all very much for being here and thank also you. saying beyond the time. Thank you. Thank you, Johnson. And thank you. Thank you.